will be presented to the Exclusion Yeshov theorem. Um, so as I told you, there are notes. You can follow the notes. Sometimes my handwriting will be very bad, so just the notes, which is a mistake on the notes, and may it's a mistake. Um, yeah, so so we have a lot to cover. Um, of course, it's supposed to be a monetary course, so in this in this um, proof there will be an algebra part and model theory parts. I will try to focus as much on the model theory part, although we need to do a bit of algebra. Um, but we'll figure out um, what time we spend on the algebra part and what time we spend on the logic part. So, so the next question Yashov is about it's really the quantifier elimination result in um, in valid fields. So let's start really with uh, what's a valid field. So valid field is a field equipped with evaluation. So evaluation definition evaluation. B on the field K um, is a homomorphism V from K star to an order dependent group here, ordered abelian group. Which further satisfies something on the on the additive side with um, so this is the multiplicative group and on the addition it satisfies inequality v of a plus b is always greater than equal to the minimum of the array and v of b okay and further what's the value so greater in, in gamma, of course. And what's the value of zero? I, want, I can extend it to, to the whole field. I just put and such that g of x equals uh, infinity if and only if uh, x equals zero. OK, so I'm just extending this homomorphism to zero by sending it to an element which supposedly is greater than everything in my group. Okay, so uh, can you see if I maybe not? Maybe I will stop at, at this list. Um, so examples. What examples of valuation do you know on fields? Yes, volunteer. <laughs> the right exactly. with the pair evaluation. Um, <laughs> Polynomial, I mean, question field polynomial, where you take the smallest element, um, the, the smallest coefficient, which is non zero. I will, uh, I'll come back on an example, but essentially, um, we have examples of this, and we will try to see how we can describe the structure. Um, in the first order language using uh, first order logic. So when you have a field with evaluation, there is a quite a bunch of object that comes with it, which um, encompasses the, the complexity of the, the structure. So the first thing to so assume that k v so that's how I will write um, a valid field. Um, in valid field, valid field. Um, okay, what's the value group? The value group is really the image V of the group. Okay, so it's a priori to a subgroup of gamma. Um, really, what I will call the value group of this valuation is. Um, <coughs> 
the book in which it's subjective. So most of the time it will be subjective, but sometimes it will not. So when I talk about the value group, it's really this. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I mean, gamma is, is an uh, order, okay? So it's a torsion tree group. Torsion tree, gamma, and, and this one are both um, torsion tree. Um, okay. So now we have another thing, another data that we have everything about, which is the, the um, Evaluation ring. So it's this set the element in K. Uh, usually, you uh, will denote it O or O index by K to to see that it's corresponding to the to the valuation. But that the valuation of A is greater than or equal to zero. So it's easy to see that this valuation ring satisfies a very nice property, which is that the two elements, A and B, they either A divides B or B divides A in O. Just the fact that the valuation of A or B is, and the variation of A is either greater than B or the variation of A is lower no, than set. So it satisfies. Um, for all A, B, I mean, there are many ways to state this. Uh, either A divides B or B divides, divides A. I mean, in, in O, right? Okay. And so such thing are called valuation ring. Okay, any ring that satisfies this is valuation ring. And of course, then you see that the principal ideas are linearly ordered. In particular, there is so this is called valuation ring. Okay. So it's the valuation ring of my valued field, and it is a valuation ring of double, uh, double uh, definition here. And it's, of course, it's a local ring. So it has a unique maximal ideal, unique. Maximal ideal, which I will denote M. And I will say that M is the maximal ideal of my valued field. Definition are, are, are efficient, right? So the maximal ideal is the maximal ideal, and the valuation ring is the valuation ring. Okay, and then you can just Check. I mean, this is really because it's a local ring. But the the unit, it's the complement um, of the maximal ideal. So it's the element a of valuation zero. Okay, but what is v? It's a group homomorphism. Zero is the zero of my abelian group uh, gamma. So this is the kernel of the evaluation. Particular, you have that V of K is isomorphic as a group to um, a starboard or star. Um, so, kernel, kernel, kernel. Of B. Oh, no, this is out. Sorry. In. Any. What? Yes, what the sound doesn't work. Ah, okay, okay. So people, people, <laughs> but I, I don't have a microphone, but it's an ambient. They, they hear all of us. Okay, so yeah, we. Behave. Okay, so that's all I want to say about this. Okay, I have a variation valuation ring. So, um, so what do I get? I get a, a residue field. Yep. 
Okay, value group, valuation ring, the local ring, and the residue field. Um, so it's it's I will denote it by small k. Sometimes maybe I can I can stick to this now. I will I will denote with a loop so that we are sure not to to mistake this with the, the big K and it's um oh what happened. Okay, read the field and the read the map is the the projection. And this is called the residue map, and it's a it's a ring ring homomorphism. Nothing. Okay. So essentially, the, the expression Yershov theorem makes apparent. We will see why but it makes apparent that the, the valued field is really in some there's some additional assumption. This the valued field is really controlled by the valued group and the residue field. That that's the general idea that we will try to make uh, precise in this course. Um, okay, so what about model model theory? So you already saw with Pablo last week um, what's a what's a valid field, and you already saw that we can consider it in various languages in model theory. In the sense. Um, those languages are have the same expressivity power. Um, I'll try to make this precise, but when I be too much confusing, we will focus on one particular language, which is the the three sorted language. We sorted language. Um, I think I denoted by. Yes, that the notation is useless. Makes sense. So L3S is a three sorted language with one sort for um K for the for the for the valued field. Valid field, which I will call the valid field sort, which is in the language. So L valid field, which is a copy of um, the language of rings. So this will be always our language of rings. Okay, and the L3S has one sort, so one sort of the universe in which. The only symbols we have are those. And in, in which is not the log logic we have that variables are associated to one score. Okay, so this symbol will only conserve the element for this sort, this sort a bit of a subset. So we can see uh, you you could give uh, more definition. So so one sort for the valid fields, one sort. For the um, residue fields, um, and in here it's again it's again the language of res uh, of rings, but I sort of take a different copy of it. Plus minus one, and and uh, a third sort, which is for one sort for the value group. Value group, which I will call I will call the, the value the value group sort, I guess. Uh, and it's in the language of the BG like this, language of, of abelian groups. Um, all the abelian groups. And plus I'm adding the symbol. So 
a little more than a group, right? It's a group with a one element at infinity, sort of uh, absorbing element, which really essentially is the same thing as a group. Okay, um, in this language, and I also have two maps. Uh, of course, the valuation, um, the valuation, valuation. Okay, and so map from K to gamma in an infinity. When I mean this, I really mean it's it's a formal function symbol from the valued field source to the value group source. And five, I also put um, a residue map. Uh, okay, so the residue map, and then I will consider it because sort of um, that's that. In general, um, non theory is so that we only consider total function that go from one universe. It must take a, a value for everything. So this is an extension of the residue map, which is only defined over O. I extend it to K sort of arbitrary. It's like an extending extension of the residue map to the whole K. I, I would say it's more. Um, about this. OK, so this is just a formal. Uh, is it clear what is meant with the three sorted with multi sorted logic? So you only saw it quickly last week. So to say it again, you have it's it's as if you had a bunch of tags where your variables in the formula, when you construct the variables, you, you will have variables that come from one or another sort. And, and when, if you have maps, the map only take only makes sense. On a variable that comes from this sort or from this sort, and, and you cannot apply the, the map to an element here, or you cannot apply this map to, to an element from, from this. Okay, so um, a structure in this language would be, uh, I will denote it like this. Okay, I mean that my universe is the union of those three things. And my formula can talk a bit independently about everything uh, and be a bit more precise and then you can you can um there is there is a a theory i think i, I the name of this like three sorted value field uh expressing that okay small k gamma uh, is a model of this theory Vs Vf in an if and only if k yeah so v k to gamma you know, infinity is a valuation uh, k is a field and small k is a field etc and, and you in general here I will also assume that v um is on two yeah, the gamma is the of k star and etc i can i can really express this so okay let's let's try out one sentence from this because probably i don't know is it is it clear what i mean by by this theory you want you want to give me a an example of a sentence that we have in this theory, for instance, it concludes that the image that this is the value group. Yeah, you not, 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 not nothing larger. Exactly, exactly. This is a sentence. Yeah, you can. Yeah, how, how do you do this? Yeah, exactly. How for every element you have a brain. Right, but uh, because I'm three sorted, I, I must somehow. Okay, so I can say for every x in. So this is tagged to gamma. There exists a y which is tagged to k, okay, such that v of y equals x. Okay. So in order to not have to do that, I will introduce a notation. Um, 
I will differentiate those variables. So there are all variables that I will differentiate. Um, yeah. So in general, the variables like x, y, z, there are variables from the valued field. Okay. And then I would denote x bar, y bar, z bar for variables in the residue field sort. So from K, it's it in a sense it, it sort of says like this. When I principle over this, I mean in K. And uh, I think I choose uh, C and, and, and theta or something like this for a value group. So it means we don't need to get R. Yeah, so if I restate this, I will just write for all uh, C, whatever that is, <laughs> there exists an X such so that V of X equals uh, okay. Um, okay, so if you if you are a bit confused by this three sort of thing, because we are we have only three sorts. So in general, you can just really think of this theory as the theory of one big universe in which you have some predicates, three predicates, which in which you can say you have like P1, P2, P3, and you imagine that your, your universe is, di is distinguished between P1, P2, P3. You have three... Uh, separate the disjoint predicate, you can express this in the first order language, we can say uh, there exists no X, which is in, in P1 and in P2, you can, you can say things like this. So your universe is a union of three um, predicates, and then you have maps, you define them that are complete, but you can, for instance, define them uh, a bit trivially outside P1, and then you say that in P1 to P2, it's a group homomorphism, and here you have group structure. You can just restrict everything you can say to each predicate. In this case, you are really in the same setting as the first order logic that you saw last week. So how do you split the universe with the, yes. with the relation, for example? Okay, so for all X, this junction of E equals one to three of, Ideally of x already means that everything lives in a predicate. What is the predicate? So you have three predicates in your language. Can you give one example of one predicate? Ah, yes. So predicate means relation symbol. Uh, relation. Relation symbol. Sorry, okay. One okay. Relation. okay, yes. Predicate. Relation symbol. Predicate equals relation symbol. Yeah. Okay. So, so three relation unary relation takes only one, um, and you can say this. Okay. So this one, I mean, the whole universe is covered, and then you can say there is no thing which lies in P one and in P two or P two and in P three, and then you have all of these symbols sort of living at the same time in the same universe, but when you restrict them to group to the predicate converting to the group, you say it defines a group. And elsewhere, you don't know. You just send everything to this infinity element, or it doesn't really matter. Point is that on each sort, you will have the right behavior. What you are saying is a method to reduce multi-sorted to one sort. So there is a little bit of difference. When it's only finitely many sorts, it's really the same setting, because you can say this. Now imagine you have infinitely many, many predicates, then you cannot avoid, that's a, a consequence of compactness, you cannot avoid that in some model, there will be something which is not in any of the predicates. You cannot, and you cannot express this for infinity. But for us, it really doesn't matter. The three-sorted language is really 
more convenient. You see, you have three different sets and you have maps and, and it's easier, but really it's, it's really nothing more than the user setting that we had last week. Okay. Yeah, so, so in our setting, it's really, you can, you can really think of this as uh, one big universe where you have the union of the three which are put together. I mean, it's right, right? If 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 the uh, if you have finitely many sorts, what you're doing is reducing finitely many sorts to hey, one sort. Exactly, exactly. Three sorted or n sorted is exactly the same. Um, it's just a matter of convenience, but it's exactly you can really express it as a as a one sorted tree. Okay, so there are two more languages in which. Uh, and you saw some of the languages uh, last week. So how else would you talk about a, a, a valued field? Yeah. How else could you talk about the valued field uh, in the first order language? Well, there is a very a much simpler one, so let's, I will call it the L1S, uh, so the one sorted. Okay, so it's not the same one sorted as, uh, as translating the three sorted into uh, one sorted language, it's just that as a matter of expressivity of first order logic, it's, it's very, it, it, it's, it's more economic. Okay, so it's just, um, L1S is the language of rings, okay, so plus minus times the one, one with one unary predicate for which, um, and my theory, L1S is, uh, okay, it is a field plus all is, um, plus P, is O, which is a, a valuation ring, valuation ring of K. Again, you can, you can just express that. You can just express that O is um, a valuation ring sitting in K to say that um, K is the traction field of O, but that's easy to just do that. The quotient. Um, every question is in K. Okay, and and so so models here are so I'm not I'm not yeah models here are just a field in which I have a distinguished so relation for the valuation ring and then and then we can talk about every element in the three sort reduced in this in this sort. Yeah, that's called an interpretation. But how how would you do that? Like how would you um, say, for instance, v of x equals v of y in this language? Here I have only a, a field and I have a relation for the ring. So essentially, I can just quantify all the element, elements in the ring. So here I, we know that. Um, gamma, I mean the V of K, the valuation group, and it's gamma, it doesn't matter, it's isomorphic to A star modulo O star, right? So how would you express this, even though you don't have the valuation function in your language, but you can express something about X and Y, right? You can say that they are in the same class modulo, just say that there exists in X, I'm sorry, uh, Y, maybe I can, I can put A and B here, and you say there exists an X such that X minus one, X minus Y uh, belongs to, I'm oh, no, sorry, X times Y minus one belongs to O star. Let me, let me do it better. So V of, v of A, equals V of B, this is if and only if um, A 
and B are in the same two set modulo O star. And you define O star uh, O times, right? You just say I'm invertible. Okay, and so I'm invertible means there is a y such so that x and y equals one. So I can I could define this. So I just have to say there is an x in O star such so that a a um yeah a over b equals x okay so a equals x and b so this is really a sentence uh, it's really a formula this is there is the y y times uh, there is the y in o y in times x equals one Okay, so if there is an x which is invertible, so that a and b, a equals x times b, they have the same valuation. This formula will only hold if and only if a and b have the same valuation. So with this L1 test formula, I can express um, things about valuation. And this is why I need valuation here to be subjective so that I have really that T1S and T3S can talk about the same thing. How do I range over the value group in here? Because it's on two, I range over the, the, the K, K B of X, B of A for all, for all X, uh, B of A we range over. It's not very important now. I cannot make this too much precise. There is a way of expressing exactly that T1S and T3S are expressing the same things. Um, it's really just by saying that you can make a correspondence between this domain and this, this universe and this universe, and that the formulas will hold. Formula you can translate what you want to say in the other language. But we call this that if you want to say something in this language, you can also say it in a bit of a seemingly weaker script. Then the last comment on this is that um, because K is always the fraction field of the valuation ring, doing the sort of the same trick as here. You can just study the valuation, the valuation. So it's equivalent. Just let me see if I understand yes, this yes. remark. Because I can interpret it in at least two ways. So one way, which is weaker, is saying that if I put the theory of valued groups in in the two languages, this one state, no, so I, yeah. I, I can I can write down a theory or valued fields in each of the two, the one sorted and the three sorted. Legs. Exactly. And now, did you say that you can deduce the same, so that if you put the axioms, so if, if you put the theories, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there is a way of translating formulas from one language to another yes. in such a way that uh, truth is preserved? Is preserved in some way, in the sense that it will be more something like every for every there is a there will be a map between the universe, the two structures, and for each formula here, which formula, for instance, in this one, there will be an L ring formula such that one holds in the structure, if and only if the other one holds in the, in the other structure. Uh -huh. So even without putting the theories. Exactly. Is, no, no, with, with the theory. So this is yeah, with the with the theory. So you mean that uh, you need to put axioms to make it uh, I mean, the, the correspondence exists only for, for the structures. And so they exist for all the structures at the same time. But they can put the same formula. I can put a structure that does not satisfy the sentences for value group. So the sentences for value group are needed in order to have this correspondence. 
or they are not? I mean, so the form, the correspondence is formal. Pardon. Okay, right, right. No, the correspondence is formal. In a sense, correspondence does not exist. Um, so we thought, no, 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 no. no you, you need the theory. I mean, you need the theory. You need the theory, yes. You need the theory. To have the if and only if, you know, to have the correspondence, you, you need the theory. But you need it, the theory in order to be able to write down the correspondence. Yes, yes. So if you have one structure there that satisfies the theory, then I will be able to write down a structure there that satisfies the theory as well. Yes, yes. And that's exactly what I do. So if I start with yeah. okay, oh, then I can construct what will be my correspondence? What what will be my map? The map from K to, for instance, in in this other language, the gamma will be really sending the silly thing a to b of a. But okay, I, yes. Essentially, you have to you have to think of yeah, this saying that if you want to talk about statement or formulas. In the three sorted language, you could also only do it in this one sorted language. We will keep to the three sorted language, but I want you to sort of convince yourself that, in a sense, you don't need to consider so complicated structure. And in a, even weaker, and I think the most optimal way of seeing this is that you can just consider uh, the valuation ring ring in the language of rings. So why? What I'm saying is that if I have O plus minus times zero and one, I can just construct from it. I can interpret the, the um, K, which is the fraction field, fraction field of O. How do I do that? The, the usual way to do it. Okay, so take two copies of O, O times O. And then you caution by this equivalent tradition, which is really expressible here. So how will I say that two elements are the same? I will consider two pairs and I would say A times A, B and C, D, A times C equals B times C. So in the same way, you can only consider as a first order structure, Evaluation ring can on the the whole expressivity of the of the structure can only be reduced to this one. So you don't need a binary relation symbol to 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 construct them. I mean, if you are really in the field in the ring, yeah, if you are only the field, then you you don't know. But if you are sometimes it's true, sometimes. It's you have only the ring structure, then you can just from the valuation ring, you can express what's the fraction field and how does it look like. And you can inside the fraction field look at those elements which are in the fraction field quotiented by one. And so this will be O. So I'm already reconstructing this one. So but this is just a matter of, of um ending ones. We will keep to the three sorted language, but you have to you have to know and you could just consider O in N rings, or you could consider KO in um, L1S, or you can consider K um, what was it, K and gamma in L3S. We will focus on this side. Um, it's not clear. I cannot really give you the definition of what I mean by this, by these uh, double maps. But it's essentially for, um, for a matter of what you can say in a first order way about formulas, uh, about elements. There are equivalent. But it will be important to make the differences. Um, I mean, it's not fully equivalent, obviously, it's not the same, it's not the same thing. 
some things will be equivalent and some uh, well here you have a little more um, you can put a little more constraint and you or you can state your parents differently if you have this whole three sorted structure so let's okay. forget yeah are, are there um, the facts about the valued fields that can be expressed in in this language that cannot be expressed in that one no no okay. no in first order way they are not. Order way, yeah. so the idea is that but perhaps in another way but yeah one can phrase this is that uh you have a theory of corresponding theory in each of these languages of value fields. And what he's giving is a canonical correspondence between the models of these three theories, right? And then with this canonical correspondence, he's saying how to also move formulas to one into, yeah. into one another. Yeah, you have these sort of maps that, that, I mean, it's really just about what I'm all saying here is really about how do you deal with quotients in a first order way? How do you have a definable re equivalence relation and how do you deal with classes modulo this equivalence relation? And this can be dealt with quite nicely. However, these maps, for example, don't preserve uh, being at an atomic formula. For example, in, in, in this language, you have this valuation of the equal valuation of B, which is atomic, quantifier, but in the other one, you need a quantifier. So the language changes. Yes. Yeah. You can express one property, quantifier creates some language. Perhaps in another one, you need quantifier. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So things are preserved, but not everything. But it's not very important for us. It's just important for, for one statement or two that I will make. Um, okay, so I think that's all I wanted to mention. Yes, so everything also uh, which I which I've said what, that I've said um, in the three sorted language, I said that I can focus on some. I can have uh, variables coming from different sorts, and so I will also keep notations. So A, B, C. A will be elements always of gamma, and A bar, B bar, C bar will be elements of, uh, of K, sorry, of a small gamma, a uh, small K, and uh, alpha, beta, gamma will be elements of gamma. Okay, so let's try to, to uh, state the. Um, before we go to the to the. Axe and Yeshov principle, we will talk about uh, the axe quotient principle. So it is easier to, to understand. And the axe quotient principle is really about uh, the QP and FP in double bracket. So, so QP. Minus uh, times zero and one. Um, so it's a set of formal sums. Okay, so for i greater than equal to i zero of a i um, p to the i i zero and z. Okay, I I will not define it much more than, than this, and then you have addition, which is component wise with reminders and um, multiplication with reminder also. Um, and you have a valuation coming along with this, which is the added valuation as zero of AI in I to be the smallest mean of I such that AI is not zero. Okay, and is this you see what I'm talking about here? Okay. Um, then from this you can define your 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 valuation ring. Um, so the the the, um, the valuation ring is you know, ZP. Okay. No, uh, it's then you have the sums. Uh, for i greater than or equal to zero of a i p to the i and what's the what's the what's the value group here z 
said. Okay, I, I, we will use very, very few things about PP when I didn't think about it. Very, very few things. Um, what's, what's the residue field? Okay, so the, the way, um, okay, a way of very nicely encompassing um, the structure of QP as a ring or as a, as a valid field is by seeing it as a tree. Okay, so how do we, how do you see this as a tree? I mean, it's better to see ZP as a tree. How do you see ZP as a tree? So the idea is that a sum of AIPI is really making a choice of coefficients from each element of the natural number. Okay, so at the level zero, I choose a zero, at the level one, I choose a one, etc. So how do I write this? I I put a, a bunch of levels here. So this is let's say zero, this is one, this is two. Um, and I just say that I start here and then I make a choice. I say, okay, assume P equals two, I could be easier. And then I say either I choose zero or I choose one. So if I choose zero, I go on the left, and if I choose one, I go on the right. Yeah. That's for a zero. Then if I, and then on the next level, I have uh, again two choices, okay? Zero and one, and two, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get a tree. Okay, if you, you go along this branch, so it's true zero, but uh, zero branch. So the elements of ZP are not here, they are here on the on at the level of the branches. I, I think this is this is known. Okay, this is but we will see that it sort of nicely encompasses what uh, what we talk about here. Um okay, so we have a bunch of so if you choose one everywhere, I think for instance you get with branch minus one, and then if you do it finitely many, and then you only go to zero, you have a natural number. Okay, so the, uh, the, uh, the bound. So how does it work? So what, when I look at this tree, there are two things to take into account is how does the level looks like? So the level of the tree is really about what's my value group and the branches. Okay, how many branches do I have? Which branch do I choose? And this is really my residual field. Okay, so in a sense, this is this. This is really about gamma, greater than equal to zero, but essentially the same thing. This is gamma, and here. Okay, if I have two choices, we don't see it, but essentially this is. The residue field K, okay, it's FP, it's the, the, the choices, number of choices at each level. I mean, at each, at each point. And from this, it's, it's I, I like this representation because you can sort of visualize the valuation. You can take a, a bunch like this. What is this point? If this is my element K, what's this point? What at what level is it? So it means what does it mean? It means that it takes zero here. So a zero is zero in, in this notation. A one is zero. A two is zero until oh, a two is one. <laughs> exactly. I mean, okay, no, so so this is the coefficient corresponding to zero. So this is really uh this is very evaluation of this element, of any element uh, of this element A. That's where it becomes one. Okay. 
So alpha, this is the valuation of A. Okay. And again, you can also do two branches, A and B, and this is valuation of A minus B. Okay, it's a nice geometric, I mean, picturesque way of, of computing your valuations. Um, yeah. So I, I, I did put this uh, a lot of times putting it on the notes. So if, if it's not clear, I try to make it precise mm -hmm. in the notes. Um, but yeah, so this will be very much helpful to, to try to represent, to have an idea of um, what does a valid field look like. And the, the good thing is that it only uses here, of course, it doesn't capture everything here. I mean, the arithmetic inside the fields, inside the ring is sort of absent from this representation. But that's, that's, not, that's not a bad thing. We'll see why. Okay, is it clear this this uh, thing? Okay, so another example which will be very important for us is uh, the Lorentz series, or let's say over field K. So this is the set of formal sums, sums of A i T i again, i greater than some uh, integer is equal to z. Um, ah, yes, sorry. So there is something I will do. I mean, um, you know, I will just summarize the information I have. Uh, like this. Okay, so QP, the valuation goes in z, and the residuum goes in p. And then you see your resorted structure directly. So here, what's the, what is uh, um, what is the the picture here? So k of t goes to the valuation goes to. Sorry, I didn't define the valuation, but I think it's clear, right? So it goes to z, and the residue map goes to k z. Be sure we are talking about the same thing. The AI TI is the minimum of the AI of the I. So that AI is non zero. Okay, so that's the, the lower series. And of course, uh, in my hands, um, what, what's happening if I do the same? Three representation in 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 this case. So again, I am I am making choices at each level. So I still have the positive part of the integers, and then here I have as many choices as my field k. Okay, so if, if I look at if I do this for f p of double bracket t, okay, I get a tree. That looks exactly the same. I right? have same residue field and same value group. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, in a sense, it looks FP of double bracket T and QP, they sort of share um, um, similar features. And that's exactly what the, the X question principle. Um, is telling us. Let me state it. So yeah, so I hope you 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 you, you know all this, right? I mean, you are mathematicians, you probably know much more algebra than I do. But if you, there are any questions, of course. Please ask. Okay, what other ask question principle says? So it is sort of um, 
left shed principle, but between ZP, of, uh, I mean, between QP and, and FP of double bucket T. Okay, so for each, um, I will state it in two ways. For each L rings uh, sentence theta, um, Z, ZP model theta, if and only if FP of double bucket T is nice. Theta. Not quite, but almost for all that finitely many primes. Okay, so for for each um, language of ring sentence, okay, this is the this is the language of rings. So first, uh, okay. For each of the sentence, there is a finite set of primes such that QP and um, ZP and FP of double bracket T disagree. For the rest of them, they, they agree. It's true in one, it's true in the other. Um, and this really goes on, this really doesn't, it flows by interpretation. So, Is equivalent to for all L pre sorted sentence theta, um, ZP, I mean, okay, QP, uh, what was it? Yeah, PZ, this by theta, if and only if FP um, of T. For all but finitely many prime t. Here, this is a theta, it's not an O. It looks a lot like an O, maybe I can. So theta is more like this, and O is more like this in my in my handwriting. Um okay, so we will see that this this really follows from the quantifier elimination result, really similar to how. Uh, the, act, the left shed principle was proved last week. It's really just the left shed principle between these two structures. Um, okay, so before going into the proof of this, let, let's let's see a very nice application to uh, a conjecture of art. So the difficulties with the addition. No? And you mean that the groups? The duplicative groups are very interesting. Um, I mean, uh, are the No, both addition and multiplication are different. They are different. They yeah, are. and this is okay. It's it's uh, it's not the same the same piece root, for instance. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh, nice. but but asymptotically they say they say the same. But it's the whole structure, no, it's not only about the uh, For all that finally many primes, yes. it depends on T yes. or yes. 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 Um, the, another way of saying this is that uh, for all theta uh, there exists a finite set A subset of the prime numbers and A. A is A of theta such that for prime numbers which are not in this set, then you have the phenomenon. Um, okay, so a little history. I did my, my homework uh, about this uh, Artin's conjecture. The proof won't give you the yeah, the bound. The bound. Yeah, I'll talk about the bound a little bit after the remark. 
There's nothing to be to be proud of. <laughs> we are not yet ready for the pound. Okay, so 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 essentially, what's happening is that in in 1933 we have a result of 10 says that k is algebraically closed. Um, then k of x uh, does not admit uh, finite central division algebra over it, finite central division algebra over it. And then after you look at the proof and said, well, you have two things that it prove. It says that if you satisfy a certain condition on, on homogeneous polynomials, then you do not admit finite central division algebra. And then prove that this satisfies this property. So this, this was used to call to called quasi-algebraic closed. And it's particularly particular case of uh, being uh, CI. That means in this definition, which is due to length, um, field K is CI. So let I be in n greater than equal to zero, and one or zero, uh, and D equal to one. Yes, and the field K is I of D if or if every um, every Homogeneous used polynomials uh, in greatly greater or greater than or equal to d to the i to the, to the degree to the power i. So every homogeneous polynomial in greater than the i variables. admits a non-trivial solution. Okay, so that's sorry, yes. I'm just going email in less than d variables of degree d exactly. D admits a non-trivial non-trivial j. Okay, so we all know uh, this, even, even then, it was known, there is this uh, Vedeban theorem that says every finite field is, is commutative, right? So it's expected that finite fields uh, will satisfy, so will satisfy this property C1. Because what, what Artin showed is that C1 corresponds exactly to not having finite division algebra, the dimension division algebra. So what I think it's Lang. Uh, no, it's Chevalier. Chevalier. Chevalier in 1935 proved that FP is C1. Actually, I didn't say what C1 is. So CI of B is this, and being CI is being CI of B for all D. Initial CI. K is CI if and only if K is CI of D all D. Right? And so yeah, Chevalier proved that F D is C1. <coughs> um, and then the, the result of 10 were extended like um, in the sense. So K is algebraically closed here. K of X becomes C1. We could say that algebraically closed is like C0. So it goes from C0 to C1. If I add, uh, I take polynomial 
if I, if I take rational function fields. And so what was proved, I think by, okay, this we don't really care, but okay, Greenberg, Berg, um, proved that if K is I, then K of double bracket T is C I plus one. I will forget in about the optional functions because we don't care about it. And so we have a result of long. It was also a conjecture of Artin, actually. 1952, that yeah. FP double bracket T is C2. I mean, this is for all P. OK, so what's about P? So it was, it was conjectured. Then already, already around that time, um, the conjecture is, I think, from 1930, 1936, wasn't, wasn't the best years. Um, yeah, QP is C2 for all P. That was the conjecture, and um, it was known. Um, Right, so, so Hasse proved a uh, hundred years ago exactly that um, yeah, Hasse, 1923, that's very old, never read a paper that old, that um, QP is C202. And then it was proved by Guy Lubis in 1952 that QP is C23. And then um, okay, so let's see what, how we can what, what we can say. Um well, up to, uh, to the corollary, uh, really. So, what's the solution? What do Axe and Goshen um, prove about this conjecture? So, they prove that for all, um, for all the finite, okay, for each D, D, um, QP is C2 of D for all finitely many primes B. Since for each of these D, there is a bound such that uh, after this bound, all of the QPs are C2 of D. How do we prove that? We should know exactly what we, what we have to do now. We have everything here, okay? So we have um, this. So we want to transfer this information via the X question principle, which I just erased. Um, in a sense, what we have to do is being able to Express being C2 of D in a first order way. Which is not crazy, right? Um, it's never, I mean, I've never seen it done in details in, in, in any textbook, but let's try to do it. I could have kept this definition now. Okay, so I have to quantify. So I want to say I fix a D. Ah, um, a remark that I, uh, okay, a remark, remark, 
Um, K is C2 of D, you can only if for uh, every homogeneous polynomial of degree D in greater than D squared uh, variables as degree as if we have a non-trivial zero. So that's the definition and it's an easy exercise I, I gave you gave it to you. You can just consider d squared plus one. That's actually important. You know, degree d in d squared plus one variables. So okay, so proof of proof of this. We fix um fix a d return value of one and set m equals d squared plus one. So what we want to do, we want to, to quantify uh, to quantify over all the homogeneous polynomial um, of, of degree d, which uses a certain number of variables. Okay. So first, let m i of x1 um, xm i between l1 be an enumeration of um, monomials of degree d. Yeah, a certain number in in x1 to xm. And then I, I take, I, I will introduce this, I think, uh, useful notation, something we, we already, um, let's say, of y1 for m to be, this is a shortcut for some e equals uh, 1 to l of y. Uh, X I M I of Y one and Y M. Um, yes, is it clear what I'm doing here? I'm just writing down the formula that will always range over homogeneous poly um, polynomials of degree exactly. That I can do that. I'm listing all the, the monomials, which is essentially are, are terms, right? For me, I can see those monomials as terms in variables x1 to xm. And then I write another term, it's a term, the term that uses the variables x. So x here, I can I can decide what this is, it's, it's x1 of xn. Okay, uh, indexed by the number of monomials that I get. And I just write down my polynomial. So if I if I consider P in a field P A of, of P1 and N, I really have, I, I really want to see it as the polynomial defined by this evaluated in D1 and N. And that way I can quantify. If I quantify over m, I quantify over uh, over x. I quantify over all the monomials, all the polynomials. My quantifier, my quantifier is the ranges over my field. Okay, I'm my field k. So I quantify. Okay, I'm ranging over all polynomials of the greedy. Nothing, nothing fancy here. Okay, so uh, something which is a little more, um, I mean, it's, it's really nothing, but for each i equals one to um, 
M, M, number of variables, I introduce the notation EI of X to be the tuple one, one, X, one, one. Okay, I'm just putting, I see this also just as a formal expression where I put all my uh, all my variables one except the, the ice one. This is the ice, the ice position. Why, why, do I, why do I care about this? Is because I really want to exp express that my homogeneous polynomial is in d squared plus one variables and not in d squared minus uh, in d squared variables, for instance. Because with this formal sum, I might have some of the x size to zero. Okay, and I I mean there are different ways of expressing this. I think that would be a, a nice way. So essentially what I will use is that if I take this formal expression and I put all of these variables to one except one. What I want is that my polynomial is non constant. Why? Because if, if I keep one variable and I put everything to one, okay, and if I get a constant polynomial, it means it's exactly equivalent to my polynomial not using these particular variables. Variable. Okay, so let me express this. Um, let's see. I keep losing them. Both here. Some room for this one. Okay. So what? What? Okay. Let me write down the formula, and let, let's convince ourselves that. Next. So for all x1 up to xn, I'm ranging over the coefficient. Um, I want to say so if the conjunction from i was 1 to m of px of ei, ah, it's missing something. M P X of E I of okay. I want to say that this. I want to say that this polynomial is non-constant. So I want to express the fact that it takes at least two different values. Okay, so I. Say the radius y1, y2, okay, such that px of i of y1 is different from px of ei of y2. So here, if I satisfy this, yes, y1, y2 will be more to right after the. Ah, right, right, thank you, very nice, perfect, yes. Right, otherwise it's not clear, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, for, for each variable, the polynomial I get here by just putting everything else to one is a non constant polynomial. So there exists y1, y2, such that this is non zero. So, okay, this is this one. Okay, so if my polynomial is homogeneous, um, of the greedy and use these d squared plus one variables, then this is an easy part. There exists z1, z, uh, that is m, such that t x of z equals zero, and also I just ask z to be different from the, the zero vector. Okay, so this means p x of uh, let's say x one x m 
these uh, users uh, the spread for one variable, and this means, of course, that it has an entry goes. Okay, so I, I say now that this is my formula uh, phi d. It depends on d, right? We have one d fixed, and then m is, is a function of d. One depends on d. Um, okay. Oh. But I don't understand why it's necessary to do that because if, if you have less, if, if all, not all the variables appear, Yes. So you just take zero for all of one, for all zero for you take zero for all the variables for all of, for them, but the one which does not appear. So for example, if, if ah, I see, if want, and then if you have an entry value, so for example, you want to prove that you have a free, with a free variable a conic in three variable in degree two, if you have a zero. Okay, so if you have just x and y, okay, you just take z equals one. Ah, and that's not appear. So it has an entry value zero. zero. It will have an entry value zero, so you don't need to make this. Uh, you don't need to, to check that uh, they all appear. Why zero? Because your your so subterranean that all the polynomials have a zero, right? It cannot be true, right? If, if because your statement is that in the projective space of the right dimension, no, but you're saying that I say that you you work you, you give yourself a number of variables to so work yeah, in a specific yeah. projective space of a given given dimension. Yeah. So if if your your upper surface does not Use all of the variables, and obviously it will have a natural zero. You just take, as yeah, I said, you just put the other one. You just take the, the one appearing to zero, and you take one. So in, in, yeah, geometrically, you don't have any reason to, to make this. And actually, I see. Yes, you put the proof by, for example, Chevalier's Cheval, uh, proof. Yeah, it yeah. will not appear. Yes, yes, yes. This is the oh, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, you, you can. No, no. Okay, okay. You okay, can okay. it, but you 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 don't. Mm, I think I think you're right because it's homogeneous. So yes, you have a, so a zero, 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 and, and you just so it's still for the right number of variables, except that one is not one or many are not there, but you don't care. I think I think I agree. Yes. Okay, maybe this is so, a, so then it yes. is simpler to, to state it. So yes. Yes. Uh, in your language. Okay, okay, I think you're I think you're right. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, anyway, you can say it like this. Maybe it's not necessarily, you could also say it in a different way, right? Just saying, you could quantify over every polynomial of the degree m of the degree d squared and say that it's not one of them. There are many ways of do, doing things, but indeed, maybe you, you just don't need to, to do that. Okay. Oh, anyway, the point is that there exists a formula that express my propos my proposition, my proposition. Okay. Satisfies by D if only if K is C2 right now because I FP of T satisfies this by D, then you get that for all so this is true for all the FP. Uh, so, so QP satisfies by D for all finite many primes. Okay. Okay. So we have our application. Let's see um, what time is it. Okay, you will get compensated along the way. It's a long way. <laughs> okay, so so indeed um, here um, does everybody understand? Okay, so now two things. This expresses that it uses all its variables. This is, is okay, but for the implication, we don't need it because if you do use less variables, you have an non-trivial zero. Because it's a homogeneous polynomial, so it has the zero, zero, the, the other variable that you don't use. This also uses homogeneity. Okay, so, but back to Artie's question, 
asked this question was uh, are QP uh, C2? Okay, so are they C2 of D for all D? And, uh, and the answer of uh, axe and caution is um, it's not, it's not giving a yes or no question to this particular question. And, um, turns out that uh, Terjanian, the, the Artin conjecture is, is false. It's it's not true. And Terjanian, Terjanian proved that Q, uh, I think it's around 65 or 66, the, the, the same years as, as the excursion. Uh, uh, it's a paper of and they he proved that Q two Q two is not what's the name? Yeah. Um, yes. Terjanian. Terjanian. His first name is G. So it's not C two of four. Um, so the reason for in in. in uh, 17 variables, which does not admit. Yeah. Uh, not really. <laughs> I give you in the notes the, the form, but, but it exists. Okay. And so, what, what it says is that there is something that I didn't see, probably it's a subtle thing. Why did you make, make the remark of d squared plus one? Did you use it at all? Yes, I use it because. The sentence I'm using use x1 x to xm, where m is d squared plus one. And I'm not ranging over, I need one sentence, and otherwise I would have to do it for x1 to x d squared plus one, and then d squared plus two, and then etc. I have to prove it for all of them, but the fact that I, you can only consider d squared plus one. Uh, I think it's really essential in this thing. Just on it, you can write in one sentence for the TC2 of C. Yeah. And it's it's very easy. Okay, so so well, maybe you use the principle for all sentences. No, but then you you would get different different finite sets. Oh. Right? Yeah, it's okay. Google. Exactly. Um, that's a good question, yes. Um, yes, uh, what else do I want to say about this? Okay, so so there is a context example. Actually, uh, the counter example for all P. So, so we know that none of the QP are C2, but almost all of them are C2 of D. Okay. Uh, just a remark, remark on the bounds. Don't, so there exist bounds exist. Um, so for the formula phi of D, uh, the bound is, I wrote it in the notes, but it's like a tower D11. D something like this. You have a very bad bound. Um, do you mean? Do you understand what I mean by this? Uh, so I mean that for all uh, p greater than this bound, let's say this bound of I think it's bound, 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 greater than this n, uh, q p is c two of d. Not very good. Um, it's not very good in the sense that it's far from being optimal. Uh, so, so it's it's okay. So, so there exists much better bounds. For instance, um, there is uh, this guy Heath Brown who proved that for for five the bound is seventy. But it's, it's quite a small bound. Yeah, but asymptotically, is there anything now? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But Probably. I mean, uh, I, I, give, I, I don't. I don't know very much about this. 
Uh, I put some references in the notes. People are actually working on this. It's uh, trying to optimize those bounds in various methods. Uh, I don't think asymptotically this is sharp. Yeah. Okay, so the axe quotient principle is a consequence of the axe quotient principle is, is a consequence of, of the axe quotient Yashov theorem. Um, and the axe quotient Yashov theorem, where I will state it in, in a few minutes, uh, it's, it's about valued fields that are in semi and semi valued fields. Um, so, yes, no? <laughs> simple zero lift. So, the simple zero lift property is that, um, so let's k, k gamma be a valued field. We say that it satisfies the simple zero lift property if simple zeros lift from the residue field. Okay, for all polynomial p in k, k of x, uh, if uh, there exists an A bar in K such that res of P of A bar was zero. So res of P is really just an applying okay. the res map. Um, okay, so I'm taking a polynomial of Anyway, it doesn't really matter. K is the, is the fraction field. So if I'm looking for zero, I can just assume the coefficients are uh, big enough. Okay, so for all polynomial in the, in this, uh, in the, in, with coefficient in the value, valuation ring, if there is, so this is my small k, okay, my residue field, this is the polynomial that I obtain by applying res, uh, then there exists, let's say b in k, such that, P of B for zero, and um, and and actually, so B is a, is a lift of A bar. Yeah. I can take I can take the two demonic. No, no, maybe not. The derivative to be non -zero. Right, right. Sorry, you're right. Yes, sorry. The rest the prime rest the prime of A uh, bar is not zero. So okay. If I have a, a simple root in the residue field, then I can lift it to root in the um, so a field. Okay. So, and if it satisfies the simple, the rule is it. Okay. So maybe you know more about Ancelian value fields as being the ones for which, uh, for, for every algebraic extension of the fields. There's a unique way to extend the valuation um, to, to this algebraic extension. The way, so it, of course, it's equivalent to this, it's equivalent to uh, Einstein's lemma. Okay. The way I'm stating it like this is to, to make apparent the following remark that um, being Ancelian is the first order property of valued field. So for any language that you choose, or in, let's see, A3S, uh, there is a set of formulas, 
six sigma or sigma n um, of sentences, sigma n such uh, such that k small k gamma satisfies this set of, of sentences if and only if the field is unsafe. A V, okay, so the is it clear that I can say this in a first order way? So I, I need to do it for each degree. Then my set will be the set of, of those sentences for each degree, ranging over the degrees. And then I can just quantify. Is, is it clear how to do it? Yes. Okay, so you see now why I, I choose this as a definition for being in salient, because if you take the other definition, which says that for the algebraic extension of a unique way, it's a bit unclear how you can say that in first order. But because those are equivalent, you can say it. Okay, so QP, um, FP of that we brought FT, I mean, or even K. Uh, are unsalient. That's a well-known fact. Uh, we'll say it again. I mean, yeah, so the, I was surprised in, in some textbook that, uh, that what's Hansen's lemma? What is it for you? Is it, uh, is it this property? This one, or is it the other similar property with uh, V of P of A greater than 2V of P prime of A? Or for some people, it's actually the fact that if you have a value field with it in an Archimedean uh, value group, that it satisfies and so the, this property. So I don't know what is the General, I think people called, let's say, this and so yeah. lemma. Yeah, that's what you call it. If you have a notion for an ID, for an, a ring and an, an, an ID, you can say the pair is in Syrian, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So if you have a this, this is and you call this and so it's lemma. Yes. Okay. Which is not a relation of so and then it's right, a right. article so they compare all of those. Yeah. Oh, it's funny. I, I found some textbooks where Anses Lemma is if your field is blah 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 complete with this like that, then it's a success. That would be a success. Doesn't matter. I will talk about simple zero if so okay. Let's let's try to state the expression experiment. For the day, okay. So, just a quick um, so double characteristic. Um, so, the characteristic of a value field would be the pair characteristic of K and characteristic of. The residue field, okay, uh, valid field comes with two phase. So there are three cases, uh, zero, 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 P, uh, PP, and zero, P. There's one, one more which you cannot have. Okay. So here you have, for instance, so we, this is called equi, equi characteristic. And this is mixed. Okay, so here you have, for instance, R of X. Here you have FP of T. And here you have QP.
uh, um, is uh, relative. Okay, so what does the tax question Yershov theorem says is um, let k small k um, gamma k and l uh, k l gamma l the value fields of a characteristic characteristic zero zero which are ancillion. Um, so I'm considering them in the three sorted structure. What I'm saying is that K K, K gamma K is elemental equivalent to L K L gamma L you can only if K is elementary K sorry K K is elementary equivalent to K L and gamma K is elementary equivalent to Gamma L. Okay. A little more detail. So this is in L 3S. So here I'm really considering them if, as model of this theory I was talking about at the beginning, in particular, valuation is on two. Okay. This is really the value group. Um, so in L 3S, and this is in L US, which is a copy, the language of fields. Okay, or I mean of rings with our elementary equivalents as fields, and this is an L group. And that's our main theorem, and we will see how to deduce the expression principle from this, although I'm pretty sure you already see I, the I trick. Don't, I don't see it at all because uh, we are considering mixed characteristic. And to okay, okay, good. Then so I think it's I a good hint. Okay, <laughs> we'll see tomorrow. <laughs> but indeed, indeed. Okay. What was the, okay, I But what was the completion of the theory of fields that you used yesterday, uh, last week? I uh, of ACF. Ah, so you want to go a little bit about maybe? Okay. Uh, yeah, so it was proved. Uh, on one side by X cushion and X N cushion, and on the other side by Yershov. On the main side, is the main side of that. So what I wanted to say is I don't see it with other sophisticated tools from last week. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then then then. Okay. So we will we will uh, see. Uh, the goal of this course is to is to prove this. And uh, we hopefully we do it. <laughs> so we will prove this and and recall that sophisticated tool that will allow us to deduce. Yes, yes, but uh, the, we will just use that that we this this supraproduct construction exists and, and it's meaningful and, and gives structures. Mm -hmm. We will just use the ultra product. The ultra product will give the proof of this and also no 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 the ultra product is to prove it's the expression principle the proof. yes exactly here we are what are we what am I saying I'm saying that a certain theory here is complete I'm saying so I'm yeah. I will prove that a, I will analyze a certain theory of field value fields of equi characteristic zero I prove it is, I will prove it is complete. I will even prove a little more that it has quantified elimination from which follows the completeness. Yeah. But this theory I'm talking about is neither the theory of QP nor the theory of P of the double logic. But it will be, in a sense, people say it's the asymptotic theory. So to check my understanding, we have two model theoretic tasks. Yes. One is to prove this theorem, the other is to use ultra products to deduce from this theorem what we want to prove. Exactly. 
But the, the first one is very hard and will take us the whole week. And the second one will be the first 15 minutes tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, so thank yes. you. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to, to introduce Simi Kaluksov from the from Dusseldorf. And he's going to speak about, about a non archimedian approach to stratification. So this is also based on other field. Okay, so thanks a lot for having me here. Very nice. Okay. So uh, let me first tell you what, what's the goal of all this is. Um, so that's called, I don't know, goal or plan or whatever. So, um, so, so what is the certification? What does one want to do? So we have some, uh, so, um, we have some say x is some kind of say geometric sets say um, such set of let's say RZ. But uh, let me just fix a few things to start with for a moment. So, um, you know, so and what do I mean? Well, I, I mean by geometric set, I mean not something like a fractal or something. So for example, um, the zero set of some polynomials. So X is the set of A in R to the N, where F1 of A is zero up to F L of A is zero for some F I polynomial in n variables. Okay, and then one typically a set like this might be, I mean, so, so maybe I can already start drawing some examples. Um, I will draw my examples here. So if I take, for example, um, the polynomial I just take x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus one, um, then I mean, if I set this equal to zero, this will give me a sphere. So I don't know whether one can recognize this here. And so this is a smooth manifold. So this is very nice. But sometimes also, it's not a smooth manifold. So for example, if I take x square minus y square minus z square. So I hope I, I try to draw this in advance. I hope it, I got it right. So this is my x coordinate yz, and then I get a kind of double cone like this. And here you see that this set has a singularity here. So what do I mean by singularity? By singularity, let me maybe define this uh, a point a of x, let me maybe first define the opposite, is smooth. If uh, there exists a neighborhood, in, in, uh, of a in x, which is the, say, c infinity manifold or whatever. Okay, and otherwise, A is the singular. Okay, so this, or if A is the singularity. So here I have a singularity, okay? And, and the goal is to kind of control the singularities of such a uh, geometric set X. Okay, now, so here we just have a single singular point, but we can also have lots of singular points. So let's take y square plus z cubed minus z square. So no x appearing in this equation. So what happens now, the, uh, my set x becomes something like this here.
So, um, so here we have a whole singular line. So, uh, okay, and um, now um, we can also ask. Are there some points which are more singular than others? And I mean, we will see. Well, I mean, one question is I could already try to ask is this point more singular than the points on this line here? Okay, for the moment, this question doesn't make any sense yet, but let me do some first examples where we clearly see some points which are more singular than others. So let me. Um, do the same thing here, but I multiply everything by x. So now the zero set of this thing additionally has the plane x equal zero in uh, in um, uh, well it has the plane x equal zero. So now this will be something like let me see whether I can draw it. So here I have the plane x equal zero, and then it continues. Over there, um, okay. Now, uh, maybe I could use some colors for the singular um, points. So, okay, so here is this singular line, and here now, what is the singular is here? I have still have this line which I already had before. And, now I additionally have the intersection of this, this surface with the plane, which is also singular. This will be this thing here. And here, somehow it seems to be clear that this point is even more singular, right? And um, so, so there's, in this example, there's one way in which I can make precise what even more singular means. Namely, what I can do is I can take the yellow part, so the set of all singular points. In this case, the set of singular points is itself completely smooth, so has no singularities. Whereas here, the set of singular points, this yellow line together with this stuff, this has itself a singularity, which is this one. So. Um, so one way to define even more singular would mean would be that it's a singularity of the set of singular points. Okay, but now let me convince, try to convince you that this is not yet a definition, which is, I mean, which it's not as good as we might want. Uh, I guess I should probably not write further down, otherwise nobody will see it. So let's take um, y squared plus z cubed minus. I hope my equations here are, are correct. I mean, I and so here, if I got the equations correct, the surface looks as follows. It again looks a little bit like this one here, except that here it becomes thinner and thinner in this loop, and then it becomes bigger again. So it looks somewhere, somewhat like this. Yes. And, and so maybe just so that you see more precisely how it looks like. So if I cut, if I cut out one plane here, then it's something like this here. And if I cut it here, then it becomes a very small loop. And if I cut it here, then it becomes just a cast curve. So no loop at all, but just a pointy thing with parallel vertical tangents. Okay, now what is the set of singular points of this thing? It's this line here. Okay, and what are the singular points of this line? Well, it has no singular points. So it's, according to my previous definition, all points are equally singular. But somehow, I mean, intuitively, I would think one wants to say that this point 
is more singular than the other ones. I mean, there's something special happening here. So, um, so the big goal is, um, what well, is to find a good definition of what does it mean to be more singular. Um, so, uh, well, we'll uh, define just try and block it more thing than okay so um now now let me maybe first tell you um some wishes which I mean, I, I so so what what would I like this definition to satisfy? So actually, um, I can let me write it here maybe. So so uh, so so one. So let me write. So this is now more, maybe more precise version of the goal one to partition x into that. Um, ah, yeah, and now actually let, let, let me already be a little bit more precise. So here, this red point is a kind of zero dimensional singularity in some sense. The yellow things here are kind of one dimensional. I mean, or one, one could maybe say one dimensionally smooth. I mean, it's kind of smooth in this direction and singular only vertically to that. And all the other points here that are completely smooth, so they're two dimensionally smooth. I mean, that's one kind of intuitive, yeah, not that precise at all way to think about it. And so from that point of view, also, okay, here I also have this zero, di zero dimensionally smooth point and here, and then one would expect and this, indeed, this, will, will, this is what will happen. So this will be a zero dimensionally smooth point. So I want to partition sets X into sets S0. So this will be the zero dimensionally smooth one, the red one. So maybe let me call them, I can draw it in red. Um, and then S1, these are the one dimension it's smooth, and so on, up to, and now, I mean, I'm writing it more generally now, here this is where surfaces, so this was, the, 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 I mean, two dimension is smooth, it's just smooth, but in general, it would go up to dimension of X, um, where, so, the idea is that, yeah, okay, I told you what the situation be behind behind this, what, what I'm saying of it. But um, um, let me write down some more formal properties, which we'd like to have. So these are now wishes. I mean, and we will have to see which of them we can realize. So, um, one thing is what we could require is that each SI is smooth. Right? I mean, this is something which we can easily achieve. I mean, here, okay, we, I mean, essentially, that this is what I was doing, for example, in this picture. I was taking away all the points where x is non smooth, and then I was left with my s2, which is smooth, and then I have this yellow part. But from the yellow part, I again took away the non smooth point, and, and, and um, in this way, I mean, I certainly get that each si is smooth. Okay, then what I would also like to have is that H um, dimension of SI is equal to I. Well, unless it happens to be empty, maybe let me write it like this, or SI equal empty. So, I mean, yeah, here, here S1 would be empty, and this is my S0. Okay, this is also something nice. So, then, okay, let me just write down the uh, more things which one usually wants to have. So, I mean, one usually wants that if, I mean, somehow, if I take the yellow set here, for example, this is not topologically closed because this red point is missing, but the topological closure 
of the yellow set is the yellow set together with the red set. Um, so um, and maybe I can say it like this, the yellow set union the red set, they are topologically closed. And so um, that's what when asked in general, S0 up to Si for every fixed I is topologically closed. So maybe I can draw a little picture of what I don't want. So what I don't want is that, um, I don't know, I, I could have some strange surface. I, one could imagine some strange surface, which uh, say has some singularity, so some, some, some fold here, and then the fold becomes flatter and flatter, and then it folds upwards afterwards. And so, um, in this example, one could be tempted to say, these are the singular points, but in the middle, this is not a singular point because it's kind of flat in the middle. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just a campaign, I and mean, one could just, I mean, may, maybe, maybe somebody thinks this would be a good idea, but I'm telling you, this is, this is something I don't want. In that case, please also mark this point at, at, least, at least in yellow or maybe even better in red or whatever. So we'll have to, I mean, we're still looking for a proper definition of these things. So we don't know yet how to define them, but we will have to, we will want to make sure that, uh, well, if this is what happens. Okay, and then another important thing is, so we'll see later, later, I, I mean, I'm quite, quite soon, I will give you a potential definition of these sets as I, which a priori looks good, but unfortunately, we have no control of how the sets as I look like. I mean, we want the sets as I to also be nice geometric sets, in this, say, uh, um, also given by polynomials or something. I mean, we don't want suddenly to have a fractal as set as I or whatever. I mean, okay, it, it doesn't seem to appear, but but I don't know. If I use a stupid definition, who, who knows? So, um, so now, this yellow set here is certainly not the zero set of some polynomials because then I need to remove this red point. So either I should say that now there are two ways to formulate what I want to say. I should, should say that each SI is given by a Boolean combination. So our finite, maybe you should say, Finite Boolean combination of polynomial equations or if anyway I assume that from zero up to SI they are topologically closed then I can also say that this union these unions are defined by just some polynomials so this is a matter of taste. Uh, now, since I'm a model theorist, I do like this Boolean equation, Boolean combination thing because this already looks a little bit like first order formulas. Um, but I mean, this is really, I mean, this is not a, not serious. Well, anyway, let, 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 let's leave it like this. Um, yeah, well, actually, I mean, I could also say, um, Okay, in a, in a, in a, let me first, yes, I mean, I, I, let, 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 let me right away give you a different setting in which I could do all of this. So I told you here that my set X is supposed to be a geometric set, and I told you by this I could mean that it's given by a zero set of polynomials, but I could also say X should be given by a formula in a suitable language, which I want, we could choose. And um, so maybe let me write this down. So for X is definable in some language L and um, for L, I could, for example, take the ring language or something like this. So it is now an example of L. So the L is the 
string language, which consists of zero, one, plus, minus, time. Oh, I, think, when, I mean, when I'm working on the, on the real system, all the fields, so I could have some fun and, and let allow all the strings. So I also allow the less than relation. And then this means that in particular, here I'm allowed to also to write polynomial less than zero or things like this. And then um, here, I would also, I mean, the, the, the thing I really want in that case is that um, in this blue version uh, would be each SI is also definable in my language. Okay, so, but if you don't feel at ease with the blue version, then just stick to the white. So, um, okay, now there's, if these are all wishes I have, then there is an easy solution to this, or what, what is, it's uh, essentially what I told you before, Take the singular locus of X, I mean, take the set of singular points of X, then take the set of singular points of those singular points, and so on, and repeat this. And then, I mean, you may, might have to check a little bit more precisely which point you have to put into which part. So maybe something might directly go to, to S0 or something like this. But in this way, you can rather easily define um, a set S0 up to S dimension of X, which have all these properties. However, they will not catch this one. So we are not yet happy with the list of things I made. Yes? Even if you change the language, you're still going to define small the same way. Ah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, good, good point. So if I change the language, maybe I will also, I might want to change how I define smooth. So I mean, as long as I'm working over the real, this definition seems to be good. But anyway. I will at some point change the definition of smooth or replace it by something else. Anyway, so, okay, so, okay, so yet we are not yet happy with uh, with these conditions. So we, we now I, I, I can put one more vague, vague wish, let's say um, as strong as possible. And by strong, I mean that it sees singularities, which I mean that it, for example, sees that this red point here is special. So, okay, and so um, a partition of X with properties like this, this is what one calls a stratification. And, um, well, this. Is it okay if I write down there? I, I'm a little bit of by the way. The, the very back row, anyway, these are the, the senior people they have to get. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, this is what I want to call a stratification of X. So, this is not a precise uh, notion yet. I mean, it, it's, I'm still just telling you what's what wishes I have. Oh, sorry. Yes. Why is it that the first board don't capture that, that singularity anymore? That, that, so so what, what did you mean by that? So <laughs> I okay, these are just wishes. So if I define these sets S here by taking singular locus of singular locus and so on, then in this case here, the singular locus of X is the yellow line. And the yellow line has no singular locus. Oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, okay. so I won't see this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, one, one, so, I mean, one, one, one suddenly sees that it's, it's, it cannot be possible. It cannot be enough to just look at S one to define S zero. One needs to look at the ambient yeah. somehow. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so now let's. So I, I, I uh, um, what can I erase? I guess I can erase this. 
Um, so let's make some trials. So I, I, I actually I already told you one trial to define it. Yeah, actually, no, maybe now I should tell you. Um, I, I still kind of didn't, I, I didn't really tell you why I think that this point here is special. So now let me try to give you my intuition about this. I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's really my, my private intuition. So what does it mean? Well, what is the difference between this red point and a yellow point? So if I take a, a yellow point here and I take a tiny neighborhood, of this yellow point, so I'm drawing it as a little box here. And let me draw a close up of how the surface looks like in this neighborhood. So this will be some kind of, of I don't know, some kind of cross like this, maybe slightly bent in various direction. But this is, I mean, in this picture, you already see, this is almost translation invariant in this direction. So almost. Translation invariant. And you can imagine if I make the neighborhood smaller and smaller, then it gets closer and closer to being translation invariant. Whereas if I take a small neighborhood of this thing here, then in the middle, I always have this fiber which has just a a pointy thing, and I have little loops elsewhere. So this will never be translation invariant, or never even approximately translation invariant. Uh, so not translation invariant um, on any small neighborhood. And now, while so 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 this is what I want to think of this. I mean, and while we are, we are thinking about it that way, we can also see what happens if I take a point somewhere else in my set X, and I look at a small, small neighborhood of this. Well, it will be a small curved surface. And here you see, well, if I make I mean just make the neighborhood smaller and smaller, it will be almost translation invariant even in two directions. So almost um, this translation invariant. OK, and this is really the intuition which I have and the thing which I would like to capture somehow. At least, I mean, this is at least one what we could try to, to define. This. I mean, this is it's not, not, I mean, maybe other people had this intuition before. It's not how one usually defines justifications classically. But let, let's just be naive and try to use something like this as a definition and uh, see what happens. And maybe we'll find out why people don't use this as a definition. So, uh, so um, Let's let me introduce a, a new uh, terminology. Um, so okay, this is actually let me just let let, let me really so definition. So we have our set X, um, and we have some point A in X, um, and we have some D, so given point A in X, and some D, some natural number, let or equal than the dimension of X. And then we say, say that X is, um, let me leave a little bit of space here. D trivial near A. And so this D trivial should, I mean, what I want to express now is that it's 
d-dimensionally almost translation invariant. So that this is the plan. So I want to say this. Uh, yeah. Well, so this red point is zero trivial. The yellow points are one trivial, and then this white point is two trivial. Well, and then I mean the way it defines. I mean, if it's. I mean, this one is also one trivial somehow. I mean, I mean so we really just. Okay. So uh, I, I want to say I will express that. Um, Okay, I want to define this. Um, and then afterwards, after defining this, um, I will set um, Fi to be the set of A in X, which are I trivial, but not I plus one trivial. So this is um, um, this is I, so I will define my partition of X like this, where the notion of D trivial is defined like this. Okay. Now, how to do this? Um, well, let's try something. I mean, I could. I mean. I don't know whether you have a good idea. I, my, my idea is now we should somehow talk about the small neighborhood of A somehow. So let's say if there exists a small neighborhood. And actually, I, I, for technical reasons, I rather want to take, consider a neighborhood in the ambient space. Um, and such that on this neighborhood, X is almost translation invariant in D directions. So what does almost translation invariant mean? Well, the idea I have is let's apply some map to it, which doesn't do too much. And afterwards it gets actually translation invariant. So if there exists a neighborhood of A and a map alpha say from u to u prime such that and here I've left some space because I will have to tell you what kind of map this alpha is supposed to be. Um such that but let's already fill out what, what I know what 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 how to say so I want now to say that if I take alpha of, I mean, the image of X on alpha on this neighborhood, then I want this to be actually d-dimensionally translation invariant. So let me um, d-dimensionally translation invariant. And let me just make precise what I mean by this. I mean, of course, this will be some a subset of some small u prime. This will not be really translation invariant, but within u prime, it's supposed to be translation invariant. So what do I mean by this? Um, I mean, I mean, there exists a d-dimensional subspace in which it's translation invariant. So we need Subsidiary e dimensional such that, and may, maybe let me draw some pictures. So, if I this is maybe my u prime, and maybe my image of x could maybe consist of these two lines, and then I would be happy that it's translation invariant in that direction. So, in this case, my v, my subspace v, would be also the subspace in that direction, and then I want to say. If I take two points in this u prime, which differ by an element of v, then they are either both in x or both outside of x. And that's one way to say it. So such that 
I don't know, maybe it's a bit expressed in a too complicated way, but such that for B1 and B2 to point to new prime with B1 minus B2 in V, we have B1 in X if and only if, uh, sorry, B1 in, in the image. Uh, let me call this here maybe Y, the image of X prime. I don't know. Um, B1 is in Y, we can only B2 in Y. Okay, now we have to choose what. Isn't it that's a general question about that problem? Are we assuming that all the irreducible components are of the same as dimension? Sorry? Are we assuming that all the irreducible components of our oh, set ah. are the same? Because you know, if you take this, yeah, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, okay, if well, I mean, well, if if my X consists of different of different components, if I here, for example, additionally, I would have a line. Then I would put this whole thing into S two and this line into S one. So I mean, well, yes, and indeed, I mean, then I won't have one thing which contains all the smooth points. But I mean, it still works nice. Yeah. Okay, so the question is what conditions should I put on the model? And so, I mean, the weakest condition which I could put on alpha is that it should be a homeomorphism, right? I mean, Definitely, it, it should at least be homeomorphism. So let's put um, uh, and then I want to call this homeomorphically D trivial. Okay. And so now I have a precise definition of D trivial. So I get a precise definition of my set SI. And now we can check whether these satisfy my conditions here. I mean, we can also already look at what, whether they do the right thing on these examples. So, um, I mean, one thing which I mean, I won't check precisely, but it turns out that this point here. I mean, any small neighborhood will not be homeomorphic to some translation invariant thing. So this one is captured. So I'm happy already. However, the big problem is this thing here. So I told you that I want to my set SI to be somehow algebraic or maybe definable if they work in some language. And the notion of existence of a homomorphism. This is somehow so non-algebraic that, I mean, honestly, I don't know it's an example where it doesn't work, but it, it, it's kind of, I mean, I think it doesn't work. I mean, anyway, I mean, this is, this creates troubles. So this is a definition which one doesn't use classically for because of this problem, because one just can't control, um, I mean, these SI, well, I mean, they're not, don't live in the right category anymore. Okay, then we can try something else. And in any way, homeomorphically, I mean, this is homeomorphism is something quite weak. I mean, this is, it feels like much weaker than I would, what I would have wanted to write here. Okay, so let's instead, oops, I lost a bit of chalk. Um, let's instead try something else. So let's try a smooth map. So, so, so C infinity. Now, this is, this goes wrong in a way much worse than what you would think. Namely, one can't construct a surface where there's an entire line of points which would only be zero trivial. So that's in I mean that's I I am I am I will try to say how it looks like. So, I mean, so well, anyway, so this would mean that my set S0 will be one dimension. 
And this is something I certainly don't want. So, so in some sense, I mean, this is definitely, I mean, it, it, it's quite strange. I mean, it's surprising if you haven't seen the example, let's put it like this. It's, um, it turns out, um, so I'm not sure whether I'm able to draw the example properly. So let's do something like this here. So this is two planes crossing each other. Now, I additionally insert a third plane diagonally. And now I additionally add a fourth thing, which will be, I mean, it starts like this here at this point. I mean, it's again, but it, now it, it will twist like in. It becomes more, I mean, here maybe it's already vertical. And then um, I claim that, well, if I take any point on this line, you know, and it's a small neighborhood, I cannot make a translation invariant by a smooth map. And the thing is that already for the, for the I mean, you, you can't even make it a uh, translation invariant with a C1 map, and you can't even get the, the, the derivative to exist. This is because somehow the fact that you have these three planes which don't twist, this will already fix what the, what the derivative has to be. And then if you also want to send the rect into something which don't twist, this won't work anymore. Okay, I, I don't want to get the details about this, but so if you said it were cross ratio. Some people, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can <laughs> say the word cross ratio, but I don't want to think about more precise. You, you, you don't want to say what is cross ratio, but some people know, yeah, yeah. So, so there's some, some cross ratio issue, um, that it's which is determined already by the three planes and then the fourth one will give problems. So, even so, this means that actually, even if I put a C1 map, this won't work. So, this feels kind of bad because I mean. Honestly, I would have wanted to put something stronger than C1. I, I mean, almost translation invariant is supposed to do only very little thing, and C1 is still leaving lots of flexibility. So, well, what else can we do? Okay, the, the, the one thing which one can do is put in one lifting. So, which means continuous with, um, with, Con with, with uh, um, how do you call it, with a constant equal to one, I mean, with, with, those are Lipschitz continuous with, with Lipschitz constant at most one. And then it turns out that it you don't get the dimension problem. I mean, it, it is possible. I mean, this, this example is not an example anymore. And, um, but still one, I mean, this doesn't solve this problem here. And um, and also I should say it's quite difficult to, to see that this, I mean, well, anyway. So uh, anyway, we are not getting happy. The problem, I mean, maybe, maybe so, okay. In some sense, we have two problems. One problem is that we can't put a condition in here which, see, which is as strong as we would like. And in some sense, what we are missing here is that we want to say, I would like to say, the smaller I make my neighborhood, the closer I get to translation invariant. And this I cannot express right now. And the other, yeah, so, and I cannot, why, well, so, so, I mean, and the other problem is that I don't seem to be, to be getting something in the right category here. So, let me tell you what has been the classical um, solution to this problem. So, so the classical solution has to be to define specifications not using a condition like this, but in a completely different way. And so classical. Define Fi 
in a completely different way. And maybe I can, um, and, um, and then, so, so let me, so this is the first step one does, and then prove. So maybe we still would like the definition to imply some, something like um, almost translation invariance. And so um, and prove that the definition implied Um, um, let me write it like, like this. Um, B triviality. Uh, so some kind of B triviality. So uh, example, uh, that's what one calls the witness application. And so if I take this to be a witness certification, then um, um, I get that X is, so if I take if X and point A in some SD of the witness certification, um, then X is uh, homeomorphically, let me write this homeo D trivial near A. So meaning that if I have a witness certification, then on a small neighborhood of any A in SD, this will be homeomorphic to something D-dimensional translation invariant. And let me just vaguely tell you how these definitions work, these classical ones. So these are in terms of tangent spaces. So I mean for the witness of education one, actually here one can see, I mean, okay, let's go back to the setting. Suppose we want to capture what's special about this red point. So, and the one thing is that if I look at points on top of this surface here, and I look at the tangent space, so I get a tangent space here, they are kind of, well, I approach some horizontal tangent space. And so you get, you have this yellow line, which is here, and you have some horizontal, I mean, some, some horizontal, I mean, tangent space approaching it like this. I mean, this is certainly something which should not happen. I mean, or if this happens, then something special happens at the red point. And essentially, that's the definition of witness certification. It says if some strange things happen with tangent spaces, like this one, and then there's a second one, then put the point into the next smaller S part. And this turns out to work in the sense that one can deduce homeomorphic detriviality. And it turns out to also work that, I mean, witness education had a, had a lot of lots of applications. I don't know what exactly, but I mean, they were very successful. So this is certainly, a, I mean, a good approach. However, I mean, this definition of in terms of tangent spaces, I mean, for me, this is not the right thing because, I mean, it's not saying what I would want to say, it's roughly translation invariant. And the thing in, about tangent spaces seems to accidentally imply it, or maybe not entirely accidentally, but I don't know whether it's maybe too strong in some sense, or maybe it's too weak in some other sense, or whatever. So, sorry, if I understood you correctly, you say that uh, the problem is that it's only one direction, right? You want it's even only if? Yes, exactly. This is exactly. This is only one direction. Exactly. Okay. If it would be an if and only if, then I would be very happy, but it's, a, it's only one direction. And then, okay, then there's another example which I can give. There's what one calls, I mean, Mostovsky's Lipschitz certifications. So let's call Lipschitz. Certifications. And then these are, uh, I mean, they are better than I mean better than witness education in the sense that don't just give homeomorphically D trivial, 
but they give one Lipschitz d trivial in this sense here. Yeah? So this is already maybe, I mean, if, if we think the best we can get is one Lipschitz map here, then this is great. I mean, if so, one Lipschitz d triviality. So it's one, it's not just it. Yeah, 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 one, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and but still, it's not an if and only if. And there's another thing is that the definition of Mosovsky's Lipschitz certification is so complicated that it's just impossible to understand. It. I mean, the, the witness certification, this is about one tangent space converting to another tangent space. This Mosovsky Lipschitz certification, this is, you have n different tangent spaces which all do strange things together and convert in some way. Is it the algebraic? But it is algebraic, yeah. So, so this is, it's algebraic. So it satisfies the thing here. So in some sense, it's it's pretty good. I mean, it satisfies all the conditions which we have here. So, I mean, and the only thing is that it's, well, it's so complicated that one doesn't understand it. And also, it's not clear at all why it should be the right thing somehow. I mean, well, clearly, Mosovsky has the intuition to define it in that way. I mean, I'm, if you think about it for two years, then you manage to see that it kind of makes sense. But uh, anyway. OK, so this was the classical. Is there any converse to Mostowski? Theorem, something roughest stratification that is one little d trivial satisfies most of the conditions. Of. I don't know. So, 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 so imagine that you have that one stratification is one little trivial for all d. Yeah, it satisfy, so it's not satisfying this condition. Does it satisfy most of the conditions? Ah, um, no, no, actually, I, I, no, no, actually, I, I, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no necessarily. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, no, that exactly. Yeah, that, that's that a, is not. This way, I know this. Um, I'm not sure what I did. It's not by you. It's not by me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure what I even ever completely wrote down an example, but at least my intuition knows it. <laughs> um, so, Yes. No, I, I probably I can write on the example. Um, so these are the classical solutions. And um, now I um, want to tell you what is my goal today. So my goal is to give you a new yeah, way. Another very classical, uh, the Sarisky. Sarisky stratification. Oh, Sarisky stratification. But also implies topological equivalence. Yeah, so there is, I mean, even more just... this is, yeah, that's true. I don't know so much about the risky certifications as I cannot tell you exactly where it fits in. It's, well, again, it, 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 I mean, it implies some kind of de-triviality, but it's defined in a very algebraic way. And so, yeah. Okay, so my goal is to give you a new definition of certifications, which um, which goes back to this idea. Let's think about whether after all we can find the right thing to put here. And, and we'll manage to. And then, um, actually, I mean, there, there are two things we need to, to do. We first of all need to find something which really fits to our intuition. And secondly, we need to prove that the thing which fits in the intuition gives some algebraic thing. And, um, well, anyway, this, this, this will turn out to work with, well, with, 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 but some, 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 how should I say, it needs some sacrifice. <laughs> Namely, um, it doesn't work. I mean, we, we need to pass from R to some bigger fields. I mean, we need to use uh, like what's I mean, non-standard analysis. So 
Um, the idea is the following. Uh, um, we want to, and what we want to say, if we want to say, we want to take a very small neighborhood, and on this very small neighborhood, we are very close to being translation invariant. And non-standard analysis means let's enlarge the field R to some bigger field which contains some infinitesimal elements. And then instead of saying let's take a very small neighborhood, you can take an infinitesimal neighborhood. And then of, instead of saying we are very close to being translation invariant, we can say we're infinitesimally close to translation invariant. And then all this will suddenly work. So that's the plan. Okay. So um, let's see. So um what time did we start? Ah, if you if you plan that five minutes break, maybe now is the right moment for the five minutes break. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's have a five minutes break. Now we have a cliffhanger, so um yeah. I think we start about twenty two. Yeah, so it's perfect. So, uh, okay, as I told you, um, the plan is I mean, what we need. We have our real numbers, and we want to have some infinitesimal numbers, so meaning smaller than any other um, real number. So, that any, um, so and um, now let me take the model theorist's approach to non-standard analysis. I mean, now that we all know a bit of model theory. So we fix a language. So consider how in uh, a fixed language, um, L, for example, as, we, as I already write before, I could take the language of all that rings. Um, and so it should be any language in which all the objects I'm interested in can be defined. So if I want to just define polynomial things, I can take this language, or in that case, I could also throw away the last emulation. Um, and now, if for some reason you would be interested not in algebraically defined sets, but analytically defined sets, then you could also put all the analytic functions into the language, and you could also do most of what I'm saying. So. Um, this really, I mean, here you have some choice, but let's, for simplicity, just say, let's fix this language. And, um, or maybe to make my life a little bit easier, I mean, I, I mean, okay, maybe uh, not, um, I mean, and maybe I want to add constants for all elements of R to my language so that later I don't need to think about it. So I'm just allowed to use constants from R in, in my in my formulas whenever I want. So let me write it like this. So um, um, Okay, so um, we fix this language or another one if you prefer. And then we fix an elementary extension. Which I like to call R star. That's what non standard analysis people call them. So, I mean, I, I hope you recall from last week what elementary extension is, or if not, I will maybe recall it. Um, so, and I guess I uh, probably you've seen this notation also for elementary extension. Yeah, maybe let me recall what this means. And so, oh, but let me right away also say I want this to contain 
infinitesimal elements, so which contains infinitesimal elements. I think so. Infinitesimal means um, 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 so maybe let me just write down the definition. A in R bra is infinitesimal, and let me abbreviate it like this in mode. If and only if um, for every positive real number, absolute value of R is less than the absolute value of A is less than R. And actually, I, I, I mean, okay, if, if I define it this way, then zero is an infinitesimal element. So I'm, I should then maybe contain non zero. <laughs> So hopefully you have seen last week that one can always construct such elementary extension, which will contain some, well, some infinitesimal elements. But and in a second, I will also maybe give you a concrete example what you could take for our stuff. Let me first recall what elementary extension means. Um, so recall. R is an elementary extension of R means, and there are at least three different ways in which one can formulate this um, by, I don't know, let me just write on one. For every L formula by of X, and every couple B of the same right length from R, we have that if I, I mean, I can verify whether the formula holds if I evaluate it in the real numbers, and I can check whether it holds if I evaluate it in the bigger structure, and these two conditions should be equivalent. And actually, I mean, in some sense, the definition here I gave is a little bit overly complicated because anyway, I put constants for all the R in my language. So it would have been enough. I mean, since I have all these constants in my language anyway, here it would have been enough to say for sentences, but it ain't never. Mind. So, um, okay, so, um, so, I'm kind of hoping that from last week you believe that such elementary extensions exist, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you also, maybe it was a little bit frightening to see some abstract uh, explanations of why they exist. So let me just give you also <laughs> without proof, but a very concrete example of how one could construct this R star. Um, so this will be a concrete example. If our language, this, 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 this one, which I wrote here, then, um, so if n is really the language of ordered rings, um, union r, then we can, for example, take um, r star to be the field of Hahn series, which you've also seen last week. Did you did you denote it like this, the feet of Hahn series? So Hahn series were not really properly introduced in the lecture. I think I, I just saw them at the I very see. end. Oh, I see. Students, so okay. So, cool okay, so then I will tell you what it is. So this is um um okay, then then, then let me take a bit of time to, to I mean so okay, so what is this? This is I mean, if I would, let me first remove this cue here, then you probably know this here. This is the field of, this was introduced, okay. So let me write it down. This is the, we have some sums A 
i e to the i um where all the a i are in r and i runs over z but here we don't want it to go arbitrarily far to below I mean, I mean, we want to have a lower bound on, 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 the, on the indices. Now, if I put a Q here, then this means I allow rational powers now of T. Actually, maybe I want to call this, I, I want to call it lambda for some reason, which will become clear later. And now, before I had the condition that I, <laughs> I have a lower bound on, on, on this, this, uh, this, okay, let me, sorry, let me first fix some, let me call this element A here, this, this series here, and I say the support of A is the set of lambda in Q where this A lambda is non-zero, okay? And before with my integers, I was just saying the support should have a lower bound, and now I need something somewhat stronger I, I mean, I want that there's no descending sequence within the support. No, sorry, no infinite descending sequence within the support. So I'm not allowed to have in the support zero minus one minus three over two minus seven over four or something like this. I and mean, this has a lower bound, but still, it, I don't want such depend descending sequences. And um, well, I mean the the, the, the the really the right formulation, which I should actually write down, is that the support of A should be well ordered. Um, so more precise, um, this is this is equivalent, right? Well ordered this is equivalent to not having a descending sequence. Yeah. 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 Okay. So 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 for for every subset, right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. 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 This is it, that's correct. Are you, this is correct. Yeah. Okay, so um, this well-ordered condition is needed for multiplication of two such series to be well-defined. I mean, otherwise, if I, I mean, when I multiply such, two such series, I will have to add a few, I mean, lots of, lots of things. And then if I impose well-ordered here, then these sums which will appear in, in the definition of the product will be finite sums and, and then this makes sense. Okay, so this um, uh, this is a nice field. So, and sorry, so what, what's the thing that uh, you are not allowing that, for example, the lambdas could be one over n? So I'm not allowed, yes, for example. I, it is not about half Exactly. Yes. So this is this is not an um, yeah, yeah. Um okay, so this well, so proposition R star is really close. And real close, I don't know whether you know what it is. Essentially, this means if I adjoin root of minus one, then it's algebraically close. Um, so, which I mean, essentially, it means that almost, I mean, okay, algebraically close means all polynomials have roots. And really close means we're very close to all polynomials having root. You can think a little bit about which polynomials have root in the reals. And if you find the right transition, then this also happens here. And um, then if you have a real close field, actually it turns out that, I mean, that if you look at the non-zero element, then either that element has a square root or it's negative has a square root. And so you can define an order on this field by saying an element is positive if it has a root. So and define an order on 
our star by setting or um, so we define a is big or equal to b if and only if a minus i a minus b is square. So there exists the y star that a minus b equal to y square. And then, so in this way, we turn this r star into a structure for this language here. So we know what the constant will be, we know it's a field, we know what the order is. And actually, we also have an embedding of r into this field here, the natural one. And then the other, now let me call this theorem, is that in this language here, this is actually an elementary, so, sorry, the theorem I wanted to write down. So, um, if k is any real closed fields containing the real numbers, then it already is an elementary extension. So now this is the big theorem for model theory. And so let me first say why do I want the theorem? Why does it mean now I can apply it to my R star? R star is really those that contain the real, so my R star is an elementary extension. So using this big theorem here, um, I can, I mean, so yeah, for the, for, for the rest of this, this discourse, you can either think of, I don't care what R star is exactly, I just use that it exists, or if you prefer, you can take this one very concretely, then you know how it looks like. However, you will have to believe me this theorem. Yeah? Uh, so uh, how to justify that T satisfies the uh, axioms, like T is, uh, is uh, greater than zero? And... Ah, yeah, yeah, so, sorry, I should have said this. Uh, so what, what it turns out that maybe I, I, so I, I gave this definition of the order, it turns out that, so with this order, Or maybe this could be another definition of the order. T is positive infinitesimal. Yeah, T has a square, but I mean, yeah. So, so on the other hand, I mean, if I take any real number, say I don't know, one over ten minus T, this also has a square, meaning that one over ten is bigger than T. I mean, and to see that this has a square in this field, well, it's exercise. Just one minus x to the power alpha is the power of series. Just one minus x to the power alpha is the power of series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, have a but I think this uh, field as a uh, you know, uh, formal power series, and I could see the neighborhood is a uh, formal neighborhood. Yes. I know. In the algebraic geometry. I mean, in algebraic geometry, I mean, it. So it, it's, it's, well, in algebraic geometry, usually we'd rather do it without a Q, right? Yes, yes. So, but still, I mean, I mean, to me, it, it's definitely closely related. I'm not so sure whether I can make this precise. I mean, anyway. Okay, let's at least in some definitely. I I, I think it's not not closely related. It's not a co co coincidence that it looks similar to this formal neighborhoods in algebraic geometry. Just as I comment for with respect to the previous week. So this big theorem Amy is saying is something that it's a consequence of something that we said, but we didn't prove. This follows from quantifying elimination of the theory of real closed yeah. fields in 
in this language. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, but thank you. Thanks for that. Yes. Yeah. If, if you believe this, yeah, this result, you can derive this theorem. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That, that's actually also quite easy. I mean, I mean, I can, I can even say, you know, did you say this? Also? So if, okay, in this language, we have quantified in nation, meaning that every formula is equivalent to a quantifier free formula. Now, what is that right here? I wrote this is equivalent to this here. But if the formula, I mean, phi is equivalent to a quantifier free one, then let's suppose it has, I mean, without loss, it has no quantifiers. But then this and this says the same thing. Because what does, what does it mean to put this in front? It just tells what do the quantifiers run over. So if there are no quantifiers, then this is clearly equivalent. Mm -hmm. So because of quantified elimination, um, we get this here. Okay, so yeah, so okay, now let's now now okay, and as, as I was saying before, I mean, if you would like to work with geometric sets which are defined by analytic functions or something like this, you can take a bigger language here, but then you will have to choose your field R star in a more complicated way. I mean, it still works, but it's more. Yeah. Okay, so um, now I want to start to advertise why use this R star is useful. So, I mean, as a non model series, non, and we do sometimes work with the uh, Convergent series in some sense, so oh, convergent series. So ah, no, rather not. I mean, I so this convergence is. I'm, I'm not even sure whether this would be real closed or so. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I actually I, I should really say here. I mean, this here. You should not think of this as as theories or as little functions or something like this, right? I mean, okay, you might want to think this as a kind of very tiny germ of a, of a function, but this is not the right way to think about it for, for, for the purpose of this course. We should really rather think of it, we just want an elementary extension of the reals, so we just want to introduce new numbers here, which are in the yes. So this T for me, this is just, a number which is infinitesimal. I can, I'm not thinking of this. But I still, until you convince us of the contrary, I could have put with a series. Yes. And I have so for them, exactly the same that you have said by now. Yes. So, 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 so. The series can be taken convergent. And I have this very same thing. So, convergent? Because if I take the square root of a convergent okay. series, it is convergent. Oh, and okay. T is T. Uh, divided by one half. Okay, so I mean, if convergent powers, if, sorry, if convergent piezo theories are real closed, I think so. Then you can do exactly the same. And then from the moment, you can take that one as your R star. Yes. Yeah, I, maybe I, okay, I can. A little, little, um, 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 I mean, at some point, I will have to think, I mean, I, I will have to impose additional condition on this R star here later in this, this week. I will not take an arbitrary elementary extension. But for the moment, uh, yeah, anyone is fine. And, and so the Pivot series or convergent Pivot series will also be fine, whatever you like. OK, so now let me give you some examples of what one can do with this R star. Um, so, so we always want to start with something definable. So, suppose now we have some definable subset. Uh, so given I define the subset of R to the n. So 
recall what does it mean that uh, that x is definable? This means that x is the set of couples satisfying some formula. Okay, and then what I can, of course, do is I can use the same formula to define something in, in R star. So we obtain a set which I call X star. This will be the set of solutions now in my big fields. And the idea of non-standard analysis is that you can express properties of X using X star, and that, I mean, some properties which involve limits become easier to express if you use X star instead, and if you use infinitesimal numbers. So, uh, and so this, the first example of this, which I want to give you is, so let me call this a proposition. Um, that say um, I want I can ask is the zero the, the the origin is it an element of the topological closure of X? How should I write topological closure? Does somebody have preferences? I could put a bar or CL or bar bar. So so this, but let me write. So this means topological closure. So I claim that zero is a topological closure of X if and only if um, there exists um, how should I just write it? There exists an A in X star which is infinitesimal. So I mean, right, infinitesimal of a couple is infinitesimal of each of entries is infinitesimal. I hope this is clear to that if I know that. So, so um, um, so I mean, this, I, I think this is, what let me say, say intuitive. For, for me, this is something quite intuitive. What does it mean? I mean, something, if, if I have zero is in a topological closure, means that I can get arbitrarily close to zero inside X. And now if I allow myself the notion of infinitesimally close, then it means well then I can also get infinitesimally close. And so and um, well okay so 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 and let me first so write me write this here. What does it mean for zero to be the topological enclosure? This means for every epsilon bigger than zero there exists an upper A in X such that norm of A is less than epsilon. So um, I hope you will see that this looks simpler than this one. Here I have some for all that exists, and here just hasn't exists. And that's a phenomenon that things get, life gets somewhat easier in our stuff. And um, OK, here I wrote norm of A is less than epsilon. I can choose any norm I want here. Of course, there are all the norms I could. And I will use the infinity norm um, because this will make my life a little bit easier. And when I prove this proposition, obviously it doesn't make a difference. So let's prove it. I mean, and maybe I could I even say let's let's we really, should we try to prove it together? I mean, as an exercise. Let's just see. I mean, you can, I mean, why and why can you try to start thinking about it? And let's start maybe with this direction. I think it might be a little bit easier. So while I'm wiping, it's time to think about it.
and that's somebody on the The problem is that if you know many things, it's easy, but uh, what what are we allowed to know? If we know curve selection lemma, then that part is trivial. Right? Yeah. Let's just know that R star is an elementary exchange of R, nothing else. And the existence of infinite capital elements, nothing else. Uh, I think we could apply that definition and see the interpretation in R star. Yes. Let's try this so we can see, apply this definition. Yes, let, let, let's do it. Good, good point. So we know that this, so we assume this here. That means that this formula holds in R. Right? This is a formula. I know that maybe this doesn't look like a formula because of this x, but this x is also given by a formula. So it's important that x is defined. So let me write it down. So in R, we have um, for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists uh, A in A with norm of A is less than epsilon. Therefore, or if and only if, in R star, we have the same thing. So for every epsilon in R star, we can find an A in X. Now this will be so sorry, let me write it down more precisely. I mean, oops. If I'm writing it in R star, of course, here this will be A, A in R star. Okay. And now. So what do we want? We want to find, I mean, it's already. It's, it's quite good already. I mean, we want to find some A in X star, and this is giving us some A in R star, so this looks good. I just pre epsilon, epsilon, epsilon. Exactly. Choose epsilon to be infinitesimal. And then this will imply that A is infinitesimal and we are happy. Okay, so this direction was not too difficult. Now let's try the other one. This is a little bit slightly less easier, I would say. Um, well, I mean, here we want to set something for all epsilon. And here we're not saying something about for all epsilon. Yeah. So this, if there is an A, A is going to be smaller than every epsilon of, of the ring. Of the ring. Of the ring. Of the ring. Yes. So um, what this supposed to already, I mean, this is essentially the idea. I'm not sure whether you, yeah. Yeah. So it suffices with A to being smaller than any epsilon in the ring. Yeah. Right? So, exactly. So, so, so I guess. Um, okay, let me let me say it once slowly for everybody, I guess. Um, so we want to prove that for every epsilon there exists such an A. But now um uh, the real constants in your language. We just fix the epsilon. So let's suppose we are given an epsilon, so fix some real number epsilon. Mm -hmm. Let me write in R bigger than zero to make clear where I'm taking this R. And we're looking for such an A. One, um, A, um, such that, um, not A in the reals, yes, in, in, in X, such that norm of A is less than epsilon. Well, we know in this R star, so, okay, we have to be a little bit careful. This A here does not live, I mean, here, we say there exists an A in X star, which is infinitesimal. This A obviously does not lie in the real numbers. So we cannot just take this A. However, what we do know is in R star, it is true that there exists an A 
in X star, which is less than epsilon, because this A is infinitesimal. And therefore, in the reals, we have there exists an A in X such that A is less than epsilon, and that's what we want. So this is, I mean, maybe this is the most, most, the most strange part of the proof. I mean, uh, the fact that there exists some element in R star implies that there exists some other element in R which has some similar property. Uh, this if it has more element being defined arguments, like if we want some uh, important element, we see that uh, there exists n and xn equals to zero or one. Could this infinitesimal element uh, only be if, uh, this this element? Uh, the only way to define it is by model theory, or we could define it algebraically, like by some equa algebra equations. I mean, this, let me, uh, anyway, uh, first of all, I mean, these infinitesimal elements, they are not nil potent uh, because we are in a field. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure what. Well, I mean, probably you, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether that's a really algebraic definition in a classical sense. I mean, you. Yeah. can claim that certain model theory fix things are kind of algebraic also, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, another question. Yeah. This one seems, uh, if you have views that the reals belong to the constant of your language. Yes. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so that's my understanding. Well, yes, I, well, I've used it yes and no. I'm saying no because recall that in the definition of elementary extension I'm anyway allow, allowing constant. So I could, I mean, so the definition of elementary extension, which I erased, was one way would be to use it. And now you're saying yeah. it a second way. And I'm saying that in some sense, elementary extension implicitly anyway allows you to put the constants into your language. That's what I'm kind of saying. So, uh, so, um, so I would not have really need, it would not have been really necessary for me to put them in right from the beginning. It just makes life. Can you easy. expand this remark a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me re write down again what was the definition of elementary extension. This was saying if I have a tuple A in R to the N, now let's take L really only the ring language or maybe the ordered ring language with all the constants for the for the real numbers. So I take a, a tuple in the reals and I take some formula. And then the claim is that the form and well, the definition of elementary extension says that this year holds if and only if um, this year holds. Okay. And here now I can consider this year as a formula in epsilon. So epsilon is now, so this A here is this epsilon. So I'm saying, I mean, this here is telling me this equivalence. I am not sure. Because, uh, so what's the formula exactly? The, the formula is this thing here with an X here, with, 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 this, with a free variable for this epsilon. Let, okay, let me write it down once precisely. So phi of X is the formula that exists. Uh, ah, I see, now it's. Uh, what thing I see? For the next trick is speaking, you don't need to add uh, the constants because you could use variables, no? In okay, that's what I'm saying. I don't need to add the constants to my language because here I can use variables. And in this definition, I'm allowed to have variables where I plug in constants from the small field. And then why don't you just keep this very instead of, because you already have constant one. And using constant one, you can uh, define uh, Anything rational formula, formula, and the rationals are all you need. In this case, moreover, that's another idea. Good, good. Indeed, you're right. I mean, but the, the, okay. In other cases, maybe I will really want to have some real numbers, and then I will really want other constants. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Sorry, but if you see that the formula in epsilon, then it's no longer true, no? Because you can take epsilon smaller than a, and then it doesn't hold. One second, one second. Okay, let, 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 let's check precisely. I mean, this is, you have to first fix epsilon, and yeah, then you can do this. Yeah, what I'm saying is if you see epsilon is a variable, then it's not true as a formula in R star. Well, when you plot right. the, 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 right. What's written here is pick uh, your formula and pick a constant. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, more questions? I mean, if somebody wants me to write this out once more in detail, I can do it. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this was our first little application of R star. Let's do another one. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm doing several ones. Well, I mean, one reason is maybe to get a bit used to it, but the other reason is that actually the, the examples I'm giving will be some which I will really use later this week. So it's it's not just for fun. And actually, before doing another one, let me just write a little corollary here, which I want to have proven separately, but, but it follows from that one. So um, I can say 0 is in the topological interior of x. So I use this notation, maybe, topological interior. If and only if um, all infinitesimal elements are contained in X star. So the set of all A in R star to the N A infinitesimal this is contained in X star. So this is something you could either prove it in a similar style as we proved the previous proposition, or you just apply the previous proposition to the complement of x. Right? I mean, zero being in the inferior of x just means that it's not in the closure of the complement, and so on. And again, this is something which I think the statement here is pretty intuitive. I mean, what does it mean that zero is in the interior of x? It means if I take an infinitesimal neighborhood around it, then this is completely contained in, in, in X. Okay, now let's do another example. Um, and of course, I, I wrote this down with zero, and of course, I could have taken any other point instead of zero. Uh, now, well, let's get a little continue here. Let's try to express continuity using R sum. So, um, Let's take, um, suppose f is a definable function from r to r. And a uh, definable function, uh, do you know what this means? Who knows what definable function means? Yes, for well, somebody volunteer. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, the formula, so that the graph is uh, exactly. It means that the graph is defined. So, i.e., um, um, how should I write it? Um, so, um, let me write it like this: uh, the graph, the graph of f is defined. By some formula phi of x y, okay, and then um, now um, I claim that then I also get a function f star from r star to x r star. So and so so let me write down. So then we obtain. A function f star from r star to r star um, whose graph is defined also by the by the same formula phi. 
Okay, now I don't know how how um, how used you are to modern theory. If you are used to it, then that's just no no problem, no question. If you're not used to it, you should ask: Are we sure that phi also defines the graph of a function in R star? So, um, so 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 I uh, so so now this is um so a question, um. So what we need for this, yeah. we need that for every x in R star, there exists exactly one y in R star, such that phi of x, y holds. Pablo Plane as well. Pablo Plane as well. well. Okay, so um, since it's an elementary extension, um, this follows from the same thing without star. And Without star, we can admit. Okay, good. So if you're well trained, then good. Okay, so we have our. I mean, this is actually also. I mean, this is a nice thing to have in mind. Any function, any definable function at the level of of the reals, gives us a fun, definable function in this in this non-standard world here. Okay, and now I want to um, understand. I mean, I want to express whether this f is continuous. Let me, for simplicity, just do continuity at zero. I mean, you can do other, we could also do continuity elsewhere or continuity everywhere. So, um, proposition f is continuous at zero if and only if. And now I just want to express it in in in, in R star. And maybe now I want to uh, let me write down the right hand side using intuition. So what does continuity mean? So let me draw some pictures. So say this is this is my function f. So I mean, if it's like this, then it's not continuous. So um, if here I just go in the infinitesimal if it's just to the right, then if it continues, I should not make a big jump down. I should only go infinitesimally down. So this is the condition which I want to write. So for all infinitesimal numbers, for all x in R star infinitesimal, the condition should be that f should not change too much. So meaning f of x minus f of zero, this should be also infinitesimal. That, I mean, for me, this, what I wrote down on this corresponds to the intuition of continuous I have anyway. I mean, I never think of continuous in terms of epsilon delta. And, um, and uh, it turns out to be true. So let me first recall, I mean, you even have to think about how this is Defined properly for all x and there is the delta such that for all x, um, if norm x is less than delta, I hope we're getting it the right way around. Then norm f of x minus f of zero less than epsilon. And I hope I got the epsilon and deltas. Yes, I think I did. So, and again, I hope you see. That this has a lot less quantifiers than this one, and and this this fields. I mean, um, the, this yeah. Um, it's perhaps worth it to see that the even though it's longer, the, this one is an actual uh, formula for sentence in our language, but the other one is is not right. Wait. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe that's also something I want to say. Indeed, so this one is a sentence in the language L. This one is not a sentence in the language because being infinitesimal is something which is not in the language. I mean, this is, I mean, this is, and, and this is, I mean, you could say maybe this is also a drawback. So at some point we will expand the language and make this also a problem. Yeah? Is there, is only one element which is infinitesimal? There are many elements which are infinitesimal. I mean, in my previous example, I mean, 
okay, we, if we have this, I mean, for example, we have T, which is infinitesimal, but of course, then if T is infinitesimal, then also T squared is infinitesimal and two T is infinitesimal and so on. Okay. So there are many infinitesimal elements. Could you make a theory that there is only one element, which is inverted? Then, then it cannot be a field. I mean, if, I mean, if, I mean, oh. if, if the twice is infinitesimal, it's always. Okay. I don't fully understand why is being infinitesimal not in. Yeah, yeah, you, think think it's it's yeah. you can say for all epsilon in R and R is a, yeah. is a constant in the in the language, uh, X is smaller than epsilon, and you must yeah. make the conjunction on all the constants. Is this but then it's an infinite conjunction? Not one single ah. sentence. Ah. Ah. Yeah. yeah. So so it's expressed. Yeah, but it's, I mean that's it's a good point. It is expressible by an infinite conjunction, and it's something which is also useful often, but it's not expressible by just a finite. I should yeah, yeah. Um, should I do the proof of this No, still today, or is I too tired? Is, is it going to be very different? It's a bit more complicated than this one. I mean, I also think maybe it's a good exercise. Maybe we can, you can try it and like we we'll look at it tomorrow. Or I mean, I mean, I can I can give you a hint at least. I mean. You notice that here, when proving both directions, we transfer two different things. Once we transfer the whole thing, and once we fix one of the quantifier of the thing, we fix the epsilon and then only transfer the rest of the formula. And here also, we both directions will go by transferring different things. And one needs, okay, I mean, not, I mean, one really needs to find out what one needs to fix and what not. And, and I mean, this is a little bit, okay, this. Needs more thinking than than that one. Um, I mean, it follows from the corollary if we choose an equivalence of continuity. You see that the inverse of the neighborhood of the image of zero is also a neighborhood of zero. So when you, uh, you get rid of epsilon deltas and you can use your main that's possible, yes. Uh, so there is something that certainly continuous function satisfies is that the the topological closure of the image of uh, everything except that point. Uh, uh, so the boundary is unique. So if you take topological closure minus the image of everything minus the point, you get a unique point. Mm -hmm. This is something that certainly is true, and now we have a notion of closure in the previous proposition. Okay, I mean, it, it, it maybe. You have to rule out the uh, avoidable singularities, but then you put uh, an equality of it with a unique element in the closure. I mean, to be honest, I mean, it, it, it feels a little bit like it might work. On the other hand, I, I also have to this, I have some feeling that this is really, in some sense, more difficult than this. But there's some other feeling which is telling me that maybe there's a reason why it doesn't work. So one should. Check the details. I mean, maybe. Okay, so let's do exercise and then because maybe we find a different one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's uh, exercise and then, then tomorrow we'll speak about this. And then uh, maybe we'll have three different proofs tomorrow. Okay.